start please a uh, very good afternoon to everybody i am dr meghna nyapati uh, a consultant at oasis fertility hsr layout bangalore today i am going to talk about poor ovarian reserve uh, this is a topic uh, where we see lot of women coming with this condition of poor ovarian reserve so in my today's talk i will be talking about what is poor ovarian reserve who are the people who can be affected with this poor ovarian reserve and what are the treatment options available for them to achieve their pregnancy as soon as possible so now coming to what is poor ovarian reserve and whom does it affect so usually as women age the number of follicles in their ovary starts declining this is physiological that means it happens in every woman so women are as when they are born they are born with a particular number of oocytes uh when uh, during once they attain their menarche that means woman when she starts having her regular menstrual cycles bleeding in every cycle uh, a particular number of follicles are being used every cycle and once the reserve what we are born with are utilized women attains menopause that means they cease to have their menstrual cycles most of the times with age advancing the number of follicles starts reducing but in some women it can reduce earlier than normal so the most common reason for the poor ovarian reserve is advancing age so as women advance in age that is once they cross age of 35 and more often after the age of 37 the number of follicles starts reducing in number and here again the catch is that our indian women or the south asian women tend to lose their follicles much earlier than our western counterparts See today is the era where we all ape our Western counterparts. I mean, it's all the era of Americanization. So everybody wants to follow America. Everybody wants to follow the Westerners. But as such, their ovarian reserve lasts a little longer than in us. So we have seen more many of our Hollywood actors conceiving even at the age of forty, forty-two, forty-four, probably without any assistance, though we don't know what it is there. but in india we see that women tend to lose their ovarian reserve much earlier than our western counterparts so as women ages beyond the age of 35 the number of follicular depletion what happens happens much faster than what it happens between the age of 25 and 35 so that is the importance of age as far as the chances of pregnancy is concerned then how do we know whether the reserve is good or not age is not the only criteria there are many other conditions where women tend to lose their reserve much earlier than what is expected according to the age so some of these conditions are women who are diabetic so diabetic women tend to lose their follicles much faster than non diabetic women or women who have autoimmune diseases and have to be on long term medications so these women also tend to lose their follicles much faster or it could be in the form of uh, women who have had radiotherapy or chemotherapy for any particular uh, reason which could or could not be related to the reproductive organs so these are some of the causes where a uh, woman tend to lose their ovarian reserve much faster so any woman who has any of these conditions should not delay her pregnancy and if there is any particular reason to delay the pregnancy should make sure that she meets a fertility expert is make sure that the reserve at least is good and then plan the uh, their uh, parenthood accordingly reserve is not the only point where we look at as far as the chances of pregnancy are concerned so i will explain in detail so when we talk about the reserve uh, this is a blood test which can be done on any day of the cycle and when the value is seen to be less than 1.1 nanogram per ml we usually say that the reserve is reducing that means the number of follicles in her ovaries are depleting uh, and it is a like a green a uh, red signal that they should not delay the pregnancy anymore so this is about the reserve but reserve is not all there are plenty of women who have a very good reserve like of a woman with polycystic ovaries where their amh is usually more than 3.5 or 4 but still there might be some problems in their conception it could be that there is a problem with the quality of the oocytes itself so how do we know about the quality so there is no particular test which will tell about the quality of any oocyte the only way we can look at the quality of the oocyte is when we do the oocyte retrieval for ivf and then check those oocytes under microscope but then uh, oocyte retrieval is not a very simple procedure like how men can give the semen uh, sample for analysis and we can look it under the microscope so it requires a uh, medications probably it requires anesthesia it requires a procedure 
So there are indirect markers which can help us to know what is the quality of the oocyte. These indirect markers are one of them is FSH where you see that if this test is done on the second or third day of the cycle, the value is more than 11.1 mini international units per ml that it is indicative of the reducing quality of the oocyte. Along with that, on the same day, if you do a test called estradiol test and the value is more than 50 or if the value is more than 80, which is more significant, we usually say that the follicular quality compromise has already started. So these are some of the important tests to say about the quantity and the quality. Along with that, coming to the ultrasound, which is quite easily available nowadays. And when we do a vaginal scan, and see that the number of follicles from both the ovaries put together is less than 5. It is again indicative of poor ovarian reserve. That means the number of follicles coming onto the surface of the ovary every month is less than 5. Which is, should be normally around 12 to 15 put together from both the ovaries. And the body has already started conserving the remaining follicles. So how do we define? These are some of the criteria which can be taken in many patients. Uh, there have been a lot of consensus where people have tried to define what is poor ovarian reserve and how to manage these patients. So one thing is advanced age. As women go beyond 35 and certainly beyond 40, the ovarian reserve starts reducing, the quality starts decreasing and the chances of pregnancy starts reducing. And in a case of a particular woman who has gone through an IVF, and she has got less than three oocytes because to begin with we are seeing only five or six follicles so all of them might not convert into oocytes and we see that the number of oocytes which were achieved were less than three probably one two or approximately three then again it's an indication for a poor ovarian reserve or an abnormal ovarian reserve test which we discussed just now so this is one of the old criteria which were used to define what is poor ovarian reserve or else a woman is of an younger age, probably she is 25, 28, 32, but she has had two IVF cycles where the uh, number of follicles achieved were less in spite of her reserve being okayish, in spite of her FSH and estradiol levels being within normal range. We usually consider that two men as having a poor ovarian reserve and we have to manage her accordingly or advanced maternal age with reduced ovarian reserve where we know that because of her age, uh, there is a certain effect of age on the quality of the oocytes and she is going to respond poorly to our medication or the number of oocytes which we get, the quality of the oocytes, the quality of the embryos must might be compromised. So after that, we got uh, the, to know that different kind of people come with different uh, values. So we have seen women even at the age of 25, 28 having reduced AMH or reduced ovarian follicle count. At the same time, women who are more than 37, who are more than 40, also do tend to have less reserve. So it is like uh, the previously what I explained was like keeping apples, bananas, pears, everything together. So we cannot categorize all these in the same group. So we have for different criteria. So why do we separately categorize patients with poor ovarian reserve? Why don't we treat them like any other woman who has normal reserves, who has regular cycles and whose uh, chances of achieving a pregnancy are much better? So basically we need to do this because there is a new categorization of patients based on their impaired response to the controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. So in these women, probably all the follicles will not respond to our injections. Probably the follicles which grow, all of them might not contain oocytes and the quality might be affected. Includes qualitative and quantitative ovarian response into consideration. There are some women who probably have only three follicles seen on the scan and all three of them gives good quality oocytes. So we know that though the reserve is less in these women, there is no effect of the quality. So that is a slightly better option than we see five follicles on the scan and get only one egg on retrieval. So there is also an option of consideration of the ovarian sensitivity to gonadotropins into accord. So when we do IVF, we usually give injections to these patients so that not only one follicle which usually comes up in a regular cycle comes up, but multiple follicles come up so that we have the option of getting more number of oocytes. We have the option of converting into more number of embryos and increasing the chances of pregnancy. So in these patients, uh, we have lesser chances of getting more number of, of oocytes or more better quality oocytes and hence uh, the eventual effect on the outcome. 
ability to generate optimal number of oocytes to produce at least one ovary embryo. So uh, the ability to generate oocytes. So as I said, with advancing age, there can be affect in the quality of the oocytes. So the embryos produced will always be of a lesser quality. So, so we require more number of oocytes to produce that one good quality embryo. And once we know what category she belongs to, we can treat her accordingly, either in the form of pre-treatment during the previous cycles or in the form of changing the medications in her IVF cycle or how we counsel the patients. So as I was telling, there are certain patients who have a less number of follicles, but still they respond well. And there are certain number of patients who have a good number of follicles, but their response is good. So it either the reserve is less or the reserve is more, which is normal, or the response is less. So there are two types of patients where there is a poor reserve or a poor response. So the, accordingly, the uh, no, scientists or the clinicians, they have divided these patients into four categories. I will not go into the details of the categories, but the rough is, uh, outcome of this categorization is that women who are of a higher age group, more than 35 years, with lower AMH or with lower AFC have slightly lesser chances of getting good number of embryos and so hence slightly lesser chance of getting the uh, pregnancy. So what can be the causes for the poor ovarian reserve? Either it could be because of the depletion of the ovarian follicle pool. Instead of utilizing 25 to 30 follicles in each cycle, in some women the body might be utilizing 100 to 150 follicles in each cycle. So that instead of attaining the menopause at the age of 48 or 52, they may attain the menopause at the age of 34 or 35 or ovarian follicle dysfunction. The number of follicles present is the same. The number of follicles being recruited is the same. But because the quality of the oocyte is a, 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 there is a problem or the ovarian follicle is not having the proper mechanism to utilize it. Uh, the quality of the oocytes get affected or the numbers get affected and they end up having a poor ovarian reserve. As we already discussed about the age, and we acquired about the acquired causes like diabetes, malaise, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, we will also talk about the lifestyle related factors and genetic cause. Genetic cause is something which is probably not in our hands and we have to deal with it accordingly to whatever the genetic cause is there and what is the consequence of this genetic cause on the ovarian reserve. There is lifestyle related factors. Of late, we see a lot of women in their 20s and early 30s having an unhealthy lifestyle, like in the form of uh, not uh, sleeping at the right time, getting up very late in the morning, or going for the fat diets or unhealthy foods, say smoking, alcohol. All these factors go a long way over a period of time on the quality of the oocytes. So lifestyle related factors certainly has an effect on the quality of the hormones being produced, the number of follicles being released each cycle or the ovulation and eventually affecting the quality of the uh, oocytes and then chances of pregnancy. So what are the treatment options available for these patients? Just because the woman has reduced ovarian reserve, we cannot always tell that your chances of pregnancy is nil. They certainly do have a good pregnancy chance when done at the right time. We have a lot of patients coming to us when they come with an AMH of 0.8, 1.2, 1.1. Probably they think that they still have enough time and pro once we see them probably three, three years later and their AMH is 0.28 or 0.35, their chances of pregnancy has reduced accordingly in the past three years. So once we know that the reserve is on the lesser side, so the most important thing to do is to make sure that the woman tries to have a pregnancy as early as possible by whichever means. So when we look at the options, uh, the best option will be IVF, though there are other options available which I will be discussing. So the treatment options will be based on whether she has been an unexpected low response patient like has been tried outside and we see that her response was not as expected and I need to make certain changes or it could be in the form that she's already of a higher age category. We know that the number of follicles are less and that's why she got a low response. So when I am expecting, I will probably make the changes beforehand. And the other one is a young woman who is probably 26, 28, who is having a low reserve. And the last category is woman with low reserve who is already old. So the concept of follicular sensitivity to FSH. So this is very important when we are planning for a, um, IVF. So basically there are some women who have a good reserve 
that probably I'm seeing 12 to 15 follicles in the ovaries, which I said is a good reserve. But when I'm stimulating her, not all of them will continue to grow and I might get a reduced response, what we call as reduced follicular output rate. Whereas at the other hand, there might be a woman who has probably only four or five follicles in the ovary and when given stimulation, all the four or five continue to grow. So I feel that the second category is one which is still okay because I know that there is a particular number of follicles and on injections, these all follicles respond. So probably I might want to stimulate the same cycle, uh, stimulation protocol next cycle so that I can retrieve more number of follicles with two cycles put together and she has a better chance of having a good quality embryo and hence a pregnancy chance. So as I said, if the number of follicles retrieved is less compared to what it was in the beginning, so we usually say they have a poor response and they require a lot of changes in the medications in the next cycle if she is not able to conceive in this cycle. Whereas when I see that the number of follicles are good enough and um, she gets good number of follicles, depending on the number of oocytes retrieved, depending upon the number of embryos formed, the quality of the embryos, I might or might not plan to do another cycle so that uh, we can increase the chances of getting more number of embryos. Probably if she is of a higher age category, I might want to test the embryos by doing a pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Select the only uh, euploid was that means the embryos which are chromosomally normal and plan for the embryo transfer. So there are, I mean, in case she wants to come for another pregnancy and next pregnancy she can only probably plan two to three years later, by then her age will be much more advanced, the number of follicles would have depleted. So in that case, I might want to collect another cycle of follicles, make them into embryos and keep it for further use. That's one advantage with IVF. So just now we discussed what is the hypo response and what is the normal response. So now that I know that this is a patient, this is a woman who is having a reduced ovarian reserve, where I see one or two cycles that the number of follicles are on the lesser side, probably I have done the particular test and found that her reserve in the form of AMH is on the lower side, then it is just that I cannot leave her there. So probably we need to give some pre-treatment. Along with that, I would like to do her husband's semen analysis first. In case I find that she's of a younger age category, husband's semen analysis is good and her tubes have been tested and found to be normal or we test her tubes and uh, they are found to be normal. She can still try naturally for one or two cycles based on the um, ovarian reserve which she has based on a response to the medication. And in case the husband's semen analysis is good, the option of IUI also can be kept open, but these options can be discussed and has to be individualized according to the patient. At times we see that a woman who is having a low reserve also, if she has a good follicular output ratio, what we discussed just now about the Ford rate, her chances of getting good quality uh, embryos are much better even in a natural cycle or an IUI cycle. And IUI or a timed intercourse is not a taboo when it comes to women with poor ovarian reserve. Judiciously uh, done cycles, when it is properly discussed with the patient, usually goes a long way in giving good results and IVF is not the only treatment for these patients. So what are the pre-treatments? I will probably want to put her on some medicines to improve her chances of getting good quality oocytes or to improve the chances of good number of follicles coming to the surface of the ovary. There is no medicine which can produce a follicles de novo. Once a woman is born with a particular number of follicles, she is born with them, that's it. So there is no uh, medicine which will uh, produce some. I have, I am born with 100 follicles. And I will give her some medicine so that the number of follicles will become 200. So that's not possible. All we can do is we can try to improve the quality of the oocytes. So one is a dehydroepi androsterone acetate, which is in the form of uh, tablets. We get plenty of tablets. When usually used for a period of three to four months, we see that the quality of the oocytes slightly increases. The number of follicles coming onto the surface of the ovary increases and the chances of pregnancy increases. The next in this category of medicines is coenzyme Q10. So when we say coenzyme Q10, it is an antioxidant which is found to boost the uh, quality of the oocytes. Probably it's a mitochondrial activator. So this helps in improving the quality of the oocytes. So after all, to get that pregnancy, it is that one good egg and one good sperm which is required. 
and we don't know which is that one. So that is the reason for all these medications. That is the reason for IVF where we try to get as many number of follicles as possible. Try to mix this first for eggs with the sperms. Try to get the number of embryos and then try to give them a pregnancy. So coenzyme Q10 is one of the medications which is an antioxidant as I said just now which can help to get a better quality oocyte. Then again as DHEA androgens, we use basically testosterone gel, which is used as a pre-treatment uh, in the previous cycle so that the quality of the follicles coming up in the next cycle will be improved and also the number of follicles coming onto the surface of the ovary are better. So there are multiple newer medications which have come like a, a PRP that is platelet-rich plasma installation into the ovaries, which it takes about three months to uh, show the effects and a uh, the treatment, all these treatments are not a universal response in every woman. So we need to categorize the woman. We need to see who will benefit from which medication and accordingly treat them. There are many other medicines like utilizing vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin D. These are all known to improve the quality of the oocytes. Then probably stem cell therapy is a newer one, but it is still in the experimental stage. So why do we need to increase the number of oocytes? So if at all a woman has two, it's okay because it's only one oocyte which is required to give the pregnancy. It's because there is a strong association between the number of oocytes and the cumulative live birth rate. As the number of oocytes increases, the chances of pregnancy also improves. Basically because uh, with good number of oocytes, we have a better chance to select the embryo and also the cumulative birth rate improves when we use uh, multiple oocytes from different cycles. So what are the treatment options? The best treatment option to give the pregnancy in the uh, shortest possible time is always in vitro fertilization. What is IVF? But though IVF is the colloquial terminology used, we usually probably do ICSI. That is a uh, mixing of one egg with one sperm to give us embryo. So when we do ICSI, the chances of losing embryos without fertilization are lesser and the chances of getting multiple embryos are more. So why do we say that IVF is the best option for this moment? It's basically because of the one important fact that it reduces the time to conception. Uh, see, when we ask the patient to try naturally or to try IUI, if it's successful, well and good. If after trying adequately to, uh, for the time intercourse or after having adequate number of cycles like two to three cycles of IUI, if the patient still doesn't conceive, sorry, the patient has to come for IVF and by then she would have already lost that much time and lost that many number of follicles. So that's why we say IVF is the best option because it reduces the time to conception and in IVF there is an increased chance of getting more number of oocytes and hence more number of embryos. So once we get more number of embryos, we have the option of choosing the embryos. So not all embryos have the same potential of pregnancy and not all embryos which are formed from a particular cycle are of the same quality. So when we have increased number of oocytes, the chances of getting embryos is more and we have the option of choosing the best quality embryo available and then transferring which increases the Per, per se chances per cycle. Then when we have more number of embryos and this is the woman who has poor ovarian reserve because of some medication previously due to a disease or because of advanced age and we want to rule out the same thing, we have the option of PGTA and PGD for these patients. PGTA is pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy which we usually advise in women who is of an advanced age and also probably having poor ovarian reserve Whereas PGTM is probably in women who have some disease because of which their reserve is on the lesser side and they want to make sure that the same disease is not transmitted to the next generation. So by doing this, we have the better option of selecting the best quality embryo which does not have any problem. And when such an embryo is implanted into the uterus at the right time, the chance of getting a good quality embryo is much, much higher. Again, if at all, I get more number of embryos, not necessarily that everybody should get only embryos enough for one embryo transfer cycle. There are many times even in women with reduced ovarian reserve that we can get more number of embryos. And when these embryos are frozen, they can be always used for future usage. That means, let me say that this is a 36-year-old woman who has a reduced ovarian reserve. 
has gone through IVF and she has got four embryos. Probably I'll not be using more than one or two blastoses. Blastoses are embryos which are taken up to day five in the lab. Let me hope that she conceives because the whole point of all this treatment is to give her a pregnancy. So in case she wants to plan for one more cycle, because she's conceived, she will not be probably able to try for the next two to three years. So in that time, this 34-year-old woman is going to be a 37-year-old woman. And at the same time, uh, with increasing age, her ovarian reserve is also reducing. So in case I have more number of embryos, which are already kept frozen, though she is coming back for the second pregnancy at the age of 37, the age at which the embryos first were formed was 34. So this provides a dual advantage. She doesn't have to go through another cycle because we already have the embryos uh, made ready and kept frozen for her. She just has to go through a frozen embryo transfer cycle and her chances of getting the pregnancy will be equally good. The second thing is now she's 37 years. That means with advancing age of the woman, the chances of having babies with chromosomal abnormalities will increase. But in this case, since the embryos were made when she was 34 years of age, she can safely go ahead with the transfer of these embryos and these embryos are found to be good compared to what it would have been had she gone through the uh, pick up at the age of 37. So this is the advantage of having more number of embryos, particularly in women with poor ovarian reserve. Now that I said about the IVF, what if the conventional IVF fails? So is there a possibility to do a repeat IVF? I understand that the IVF is time consuming and monetarily exhausting to many of the people. But or as we say, not always is IVF successful. All the more we know that the number of eggs are less, the number of oocytes which can be retrieved are less and because we have less number of oocytes, chance of selecting the embryos probably might not be there and chance of pregnancy might be on the lower side. So in case a particular IVF cycle fails, what are the options available? Repeat IVF cycle can be performed. There is certainly no specific uh, indicator, there is no specific cutoff number where we say that yes, this is the only number limit to which you can plan for your IVF. If not, probably you cannot plan for IVF. There is no specific cutoff number as long as we get oocytes, which can be fertilized with the sperm either in the form of IVF or ICSI, we can continue to go ahead with IVF cycles. But usually we will get to know the outcome in two to three cycles and accordingly the IVF cycle has to be performed. But even before I go to the next IVF cycle, should I look at any factors because of which this cycle failed? Certainly yes, because I, we will be always looking for the factors which could have led to this IVF um, uh, failure and try to correct it next time, either in the form of starting of a particular cycle or in the form of the dosage of medications which we use or in the form of the pre-treatment medications or the duration of pre-treatment. All these things we usually uh, check for and different protocols to be used. Not necessarily, there are multiple protocols which we are using in IVF cycle to get the best results in a particular couple. The uh, same size fits all doesn't apply to the infertility treatment. Different people come for infertility treatment due to different causes and the same kind of treatment is usually not beneficial. So in case a particular IVF cycle has failed, then there is always the option that we can change the protocol and then do the cycle in a particular cycle which we feel that is good enough to give us a pregnancy and then uh, plan for the stimulation accordingly. So uh, we are now that we talked about what are the treatment options available, what are the pre-treatment medications available, which is the best form of treatment in these people. In spite of what we do, there are certain group of patients where we know that their response is very poor. Even though I have given her the maximum dosage of the gonadotropins during stimulation, even though we have done a lot of pre-treatment, that means medications given before the start of the IVF cycle, we still might end up having some poor responses. So certain newer therapies are coming up like ovarian fragmentation and in vitro activation, ovarian PRP therapy, which we just discussed for ovarian rejuvenation, and application of mitochondrial activation. That means not only the quality of the oocyte getting affected because of the aging, it is basically the mitochondria which is affected because of the effect of aging. So changing only the mitochondria helps in getting better quality oocyte, but still giving the ability to the woman to maintain her intact her gametes, her chromosomal identity. 
So this is the advantage of mitochondrial activation. So these are the things which we, we wanted, I wanted to discuss among the core responder groups. And um, if at all somebody would say, what are the protocols which are used? One of the protocols which is used is basically our uh, antagonist protocol. But a lot of people might or might respond to this protocol. And there is no injection which can produce the follicles. As I said, we are born with a particular number of follicles. And once they are used up, then we don't have the option of producing these follicles again in the body. So uh, we find that even though I give her the highest dose, I'm getting only few follicles, then probably I might want to change my protocol, like give them a very mild stimulation, which becomes both oocyte friendly, because I'm not bombarding her ovaries with follicles, and also patient friendly, because she need not take so many medications, so many injections, and other side effects probably of those injections, though we say that we feel that the side effects are much lesser. The, the problem with taking everyday injections, multiple injections, is the pain associated with the prick. So that can be reduced by doing a mild stimulation or a modified natural cycle IVF. Now, there might be some patients where we see that on the first day when we start the stimulation in that particular cycle, when we do the pickup, I might get only one or two oocytes. But when I see her probably a few days after the oocyte retrieval, I might find that we are able to see some more follicles. So these are the type of patients where a dual stimulation, what we call as Shandai protocol, can be utilized. That means in one particular cycle, because the follicles are being produced in days. It's not like follicle is produced only on the second day, and if not there, then I'll have to wait for the next cycle. Follicles are being produced and brought to the surface of the ovary in waves. So what we do is we do the retrieval in the first half of the cycle. Since we have the embryos outside and there is no chance that she can have a natural conception because unless we do the transfer of the embryos, natural conception, may, conception might not happen. So we can always stimulate her in the second half of the cycle, what we call as luteal phase stimulation and stimulating the ovaries in both halves of the cycle is called dual stimulation. So the advantage of this dual stimulation will be that in one cycle without wasting much time, she has a chance of getting more number of oocytes. More the number of oocytes, better is the chances of pregnancy. Though we stimulate the ovary in two parts of the same cycle, we have found that there is no change in the quality of the oocytes and these patients have a better uh, chance of getting more number of embryos and more the number of embryos, the chances are better of having a successful outcome. So these are some of the changes which we do in these patients with poor ovarian reserve so that we get the best possible results in the shortest possible time. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. I am seeing a question here. How much AMH is required for IVF? Uh, there is no particular value what we call as this is one particular value which is required for IVF beyond which uh, below which I will not be able to do the IVF cycle. Certainly if the AMH is less than 0.3, that means the number of follicles which we are expecting to get will be much lesser. Uh, and an AMH value of more than 1.1 usually tells that the number of follicles which we can get might be slightly better. The next question what I see here is how successful is IVF with low ovarian reserve? Again, low ovarian reserve is not the only indication why she will be going through IVF as I discussed before. We also take into consideration her age. A woman who is of younger age group with low ovarian reserve has a better chance of pregnancy than any woman who is of an older age group with a low ovarian reserve. If I talk about the percentages, certainly a woman who has got good number of embryos, when I say good number of embryos, at least two to three good quality blastocysts, then her chances of achieving pregnancy is as good as the other woman with normal ovarian reserve, which is probably 50 to 65 percent. But in women with older age group, even though we might have good quality looking embryos, what we call as blastocysts, 
uh, which are day five embryos. That means these embryos have been grown in the lab for five days and look for their competency to grow in the lab. But because in these women, the chances of chromosomal abnormalities are slightly higher, the chance of pregnancy is slightly lower compared to younger age women with the same kind of ovarian result. How low? Uh, does low ovarian reserve mean low quality eggs? Not always. Uh, if a woman with a low younger age group has a low reserve, her quality of oocytes can still be equivalent to women of her age who have a good ovarian reserve. Whereas in elder early age women, even though the reserve is just borderline or slightly low in the lower range, the quality of the eggs will be affected. This is the general consensus. But to a certain extent, when we see that the ovarian reserve is on the lesser side, as I said, the body has probably utilized all the good quality oocytes. It's like when we go to a shop, we usually select the best ones first. And when we go later uh, in the day to buy from the market, we get the uh, average quality ones. So the same, uh, the logic might apply to the ovarian reserve also, that the, um, the follicles which have been used up much earlier were probably good quality ones. And these are the remaining oocytes. Along with that, uh, in a woman who is approximately 35 years, if I take as an example, these are the follicles in the ovary which has been exposed to the external factors for all 35 years compared to the follicles which had been used up at the age of 20. These were exposed to the external factors only for 20 years. So when I tell about the external factors, be it the lifestyle factors, it can be the pollutants to which we are exposed to, it can be to the toxic chemicals which we are exposed to. It can be due to the oxidative stress which we are exposing our body to. All these factors go a long way in uh, maintaining the quality of the oocytes or it helps us to analyze what could be the quality of the oocytes. Yeah, this is a very important question. How do I know if I have a low ovarian reserve? Any woman who wants to know if a reserve is good can get a blood test done, which is called an AMH blood test. This can be done on any day of the cycle. It can be done at any time of the day. When I say any day of the cycle, it need not be done in the follicular phase. That means on the second or third day of the cycle, which is a prerequisite for certain blood test. And when I say any time of the day, it need not be done at the, um, on fasting status or anything like that. So AMH is the blood test which helps us to tell the ovarian reserve and any value less than 1.1 indicates that the reserve is on the lower side. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you so much.